Sunday, September 13. It was a cold and windy day, drizzling fine rain, which was the first sign of approaching winter. But it was still a glorious day, because we were leaving Arkhangelsk after a forced two-month delay. We were not daunted by the prospect of facing fall storms, nor by the possibility of violent skirmishes with German planes and submarines. We were only two weeks away from a vacation home, those who would remain alive, better to face danger than to rot alive in a wooden prison. To the 16 merchant ships in the QP-14 convoy, several had previously been part of P-17. They were joined by other ships waiting for the return convoy. Most of the transports were going empty, although some did have cargo that the Russians had supplied us with, including wood. The British ship Ocean Voice unexpectedly had several women and children as passengers. These were the families of the Russian trade delegation in England. Only Russian women could dare to undertake such a risky journey, and only Russian men could authorize them to do so. The Ocean Voice was the Commodore ship of the Pu-16 convoy. During the crossing, the ship suffered a large breach in the side when a bomb exploded, but the crew put out the fires and brought the ship into port. So Ocean Voice put to sea again and was once again the flagship. Commodore John Dowding was on board her. The convoy slowly followed in two columns. One was led by the Ounch of Voice and the other by our friends from the Ounch Freedom. The commander of the transport walker was appointed Vice Commodore. Most of the PQ-17 escort ships were with us again. Air defence ships, corvettes, trawlers and both salvage ships. In addition to these, we were joined by two destroyers and three minesweepers. The number of escort ships was exactly equal to the number of transports, but soon the escort was to be strengthened. Some of the escort ships of the PQ-18 convoy were to join us after their charges reached the final stretch of the route to Russia. The White Sea met us with a nasty wave, and the coal in the Lord Austin's bunkers began to shift dangerously, threatening to capsize the ship. As we headed north into the Barents Sea, our only opponent was the weather. After a long and hot summer, it was hard to get used to the harsh Arctic conditions again. Even more difficult was the empty transports, which now towered high above the waves. It was strange to see these gloomy waters suddenly illuminated by the fairy light of the Aurora Borealis. First, white beams appeared above the horizon, like gigantic searchlights sweeping across the sky. Then from them began to diverge straight branches, which crossed each other. Soon the entire sky was covered with a strange geometric pattern. At times, these patterns bloomed with the most bizarre colours. This fantastic sight helped the sailors to shorten the long hours of night watch. And on the first night, during a blizzard, illuminated by the northern lights, the Winston Salem got into trouble. Because of the magnetic storm that accompanied the northern lights, its magnetic compass failed completely. The ship had no gyro compass and lost her convoy. All the skipper could do was to move exactly to the north and try to get to the edge of the ice sheet, as ships that had broken away from the convoy usually did. Soon afterward, the coal-bound old ironclad began to fall behind. Escort ships kept coming up to it and trying to get it to increase its speed, but in vain. He could not squeeze out a knot more. The convoy was forced to drop speed for an hour or two, and then to proceed again at the usual speed, leaving the ironclad astern. Finally, it was decided to leave this ship to follow on her own at all, giving her a minesweeper as escort. For the other ships, the first three days of the voyage passed without adventure. Although the weather was cold with blizzards and thick fog, we finally saw our airplanes hurricane fighters, and then Russian seaplanes and Catalinas. A few Ju-88s flashed by, following us from afar. But they did not bother the convoy, keeping out of range of our anti-aircraft guns. September 15 was a black day for the crew of the Pozariki. On that day, the unfortunate fellows finished off the rest of the rum supply. We were lucky because we handled our supplies, which were a wild mishmash of vodka and rum more carefully. All of our problems were due to a group of rescuers who happened to be on board. When they discovered that they had been put on the staff list, stokers in the stoker, sailors as lookouts and helmsmen, 
they sent a deputation to the captain. They wanted to explain that the contract required us to bring them home as passengers. Termed the captain refused to meet them, saying that he had his laws to live by on his ship, and every healthy man was obliged to work. When the rescued men sent him a note refusing to stand watch, the reply was short and rude, no watch. The rebel leader then hurriedly washed his hands of the matter, declaring that no one would force him personally to work against his will. He lay down in his bunk and declared himself sick, though he was, of course, perfectly well. But he got his food. Our other fourteen guests, of whom six were coloured, were a motley crowd. Only three had been to sea before, but two of the former cowboys had seen the sea for the first time, having been on a PQ-17. The heavy stoker, who had been in the Navy since the days of sailing ships, looked at them with undisguised contempt. He could sit down next to the furnace and say loudly to our sailors, looking at the newcomers. They looked most of all like a pack of grammar school girls. I would never take them to sea with me. I liked men, not gymnasium girls. But it's all gymnasium girls, bye bye. Another veteran among the aliens was the ship's carpenter, who became their leader and spokesman. This man could do absolutely everything and do it very well. He willingly volunteered to help wherever needed. He managed his fellows intelligently and tactfully, and we found him to be an excellent fellow, both on watch and in the wardroom, for he possessed an even calm temperament and an uncommon sense of humour. EKD. On September 16, the fourth day of the voyage, the convoy was still in the Barents Sea. The strongest snowstorm did not cease. We were now and then caught in bands of dense fog. Many majestic icebergs sailed by. The next morning we had to meet the escort ships that left the PQ-18 convoy, and indeed about noon a white rocket was seen on the horizon. Early on the morning of September 17, we were joined by an impressive force commanded by Rear Admiral Robert Barnett, who held the flag on the cruiser Scylla. Along with him were no less than 17 destroyers, and now more than 40 warships were escorting 14 transports. But we were not looking at the destroyers at all. The attention of literally all of us was riveted on one ship in Barnett's compound, its silhouette appeared on the horizon could be mistaken for a pudding mould. It was the aircraft carrier Avenger. It seemed small and clumsy, this aircraft carrier from the Ulworth. Jokers claimed that you should flick it a couple times and you'd bathe. But for the men who had enemy planes and submarines chasing them all over the Barents Sea, it was a joy to see it. We watched with delight the little black gnats crawling across its flight deck. From a great distance it seemed as if they were moving agonizingly slow and about to fall into the sea. However, each plane took to the air confidently, made a circle over their ship, and turned south to begin patrolling. It was strange to see them exchanging signals with the aircraft carrier. The flashes of Aldis' lamp seemed larger than the airplane itself, which was turning into a strange twinkling star. These reconnaissance planes were good old swordfish biplanes. However, at the stern of this pudding mould could be seen the lumbering silhouettes of several sea hurricane fighters, specially designed to operate from aircraft carriers. It was the first time many of us had seen anything resembling a hurricane or spitfire over the sea at all. We suddenly felt a confidence unheard of before. The Avenger took its place in the centre of the convoy. This was also a departure from the usual tactics of escort ships, but there the aircraft carrier had maximum protection from torpedoes. However, this disposition greatly unnerved the captains of neighbouring ships, as the aircraft carrier too often sharply increased speed and turned against the wind to lift planes. Already many alarms had been sounded after the discovery of submarines, and many depth bombs had been dropped. The effect of their bursts on the rescued sailors on the Austin was terrific. At the next explosion they would jump up and were close to panic. The same problems occurred on the other escort ships, and the Zamalik every time an alert was declared. The ship's sick bay was full of Dutchmen from the crew of the Paulus Potter. Many were severely frostbitten and had lost fingers and toes. They were tall men, but at every alarm they had to be carried to the upper deck and then carried back. The temperature continued to drop and thick snow was falling. We were now followed by two squadron tankers, 
which were constantly refueled by warships that had never yet seen land since leaving England. One of these tankers was our old convoy mate Tu-17 Grey Ranger, which was then damaged by ice and turned back. The convoy kept a decent speed of about eight knots so far, and finally we were in the vicinity of Medveji Island. It was here that we came under the heaviest attacks as we sailed for Russia. Swordfish, which were hunting for submarines, could not prevent the flying boat Blom and Hitchin following us. The destroyer escort several times opened fire on the German scout, but he prudently kept far away. Then he was joined by two more planes, and they pursued us for several hours. Avenger picked up a few more planes, and the cat and mouse game began. It was strange to see our planes on one flank of the convoy and German planes on the other, but these herrings were very fidgety. Every time the carrier planes headed toward them, the Germans described a wide arc and came out on the opposite side of the convoy. The sight of enemy planes was completely unfamiliar to the Russian delegation on the Aisha. They were convinced that there was no war outside the Soviet Union and that these planes were Arikansky. But the air attack did not begin, and the German scouts flew away. The next morning, September 19, the sun looked out for the first time in many days. Its rays were reflected from some object ahead of us on our course. At first we thought it was another big iceberg, but it turned out to be Spitsbergen Island. At morning, one of the missing transports showed up unexpectedly. Winston Salem alone at night went to the edge of the polar ice and now appeared directly in the path of our convoy. As we sailed along the coast of Spitsbergen, another squadron tanker joined us, delivering a new supply of fuel. Still keeping just off the coast, the convoy turned north. This was an attempt to deceive the enemy and increase the distance to the airfields near Nordkap. A few hours later we turned southwest again, and the long trek to Iceland began. Escort ships continued to drive off enemy submarines, and the herrings did not appear again. We began to hope that this time our herd would get home safely. Et et. The next day, September 20, was a Sunday. It was another black Sunday. At about 5.30, the observers on the trawl Ayrshire noticed a strange swirl among the waves. While they were looking puzzled at the mysterious phenomenon, several explosions shook the minesweeper leader, going astern of the convoy. It was torpedoed and was at once in very grave danger. The Nuffin Gem was coming two miles astern of the convoy. The trawler was about one half miles on the left traverse of the leader. When a muffled explosion was heard and flames were thrown out of the leader chimney, Lieutenant Mullinder immediately jerked the engine telegraph handles, giving full ahead. I turned the AGM starboard, intending to approach the starboard leeward side of the leader. When we were within 250 yards of the minesweeper, I saw many sailors running down the half bank to the foretop. The midship was engulfed in flames and threatened to break in half. I ordered my sailors to get the port side dinghy away from the lee boards so as not to crush her when we came abreast of the minesweepers. I figured we could still use her before we got home. Then, looking back at the leader, I saw an officer jump overboard and swim toward us. Damn it, what the devil is he doing? It was a most unwise thing to do because the rest of the sailors also started jumping into the sea from the half tank and jumping out of the torpedo hole in the side. I stopped the gem within fifty yards of the minesweeper's bow, or we would have drowned all those men. I ordered our dinghy lowered and lifted the men out of the water. But it was damned hard to hold them down, as they were all covered with oil that was leaking from the torpedoed ship's tanks. The rest of the sailors were on life rafts and were hoisted aboard us by nets. A trawler that came between us and the leader approached the six sailors that were on the raft. I believe one of them was the leader's medic. I saw all six end up under the bottom of the trawler. The flipped over, and the last thing I saw was the captain sitting on the bottom of the ship, or what was left of the ship. I think he was rescued in time. The destroyer came running and ordered me to leave the men in the water and go back to the convoy. I told him to go to hell. His captain was right in one respect, because if we had been torpedoed at that time, a lot of people would have died, 
If only the crew of the leader had waited until we came aboard, we probably would have saved a lot more. The gem managed to pull about seventy people out of the water, but the rest were doomed. The trawler Ayrshire had no life nets or storm traps. So Sub-Lieutenant John Aylott and other sailors hung over the side, grabbing the hands of people who were floating. At the same time, they themselves had to be held by their feet to keep them from falling into the water. Too often, however, the oil-covered hands of the swimmers slipped. The men were swept away by the waves and they drowned. The saddest part was that this is how the six sailors of the River Ofton, whom the leader was supposed to take home, died. Many of those rescued from the water died later. It was a brutal blow. After that, the pursuers reappeared in the sky. All day long the alarm was constantly sounded. The Avenger airplanes were getting into the air properly, but these vultures kept circling on the horizon. At about 5.0 p.m., the Austin shuddered as if a depth bomb had exploded directly beneath it. We were on the starboard shell of the convoy at the time. Everyone turned around in a friendly manner toward the transports about a mile away from us. We saw a huge water fountain rising off the bow of another PQ-17 veteran, the Silver Sword. This transport was loaded to the brim with timber. As we looked over in surprise, the Austin shuddered once more, and a second fountain rose off the side in the sword's midsection. Maybe they're bombing him. Someone asked, looking up into the sky. But before he had finished his sentence, we felt a third jolt, and a red glow appeared over the stern of the sword. And then we realized the answer, torpedoes again. The transport took three hits at once. However, it seemed to continue onward, and at first glance did not suffer serious damage. But then the sword began to lose momentum. Two escort ships headed towards it, and soon they all disappeared astern. These three torpedoes destroyed the sword's forward and aft crew quarters. This could have resulted in the heaviest casualties, but by a strange coincidence almost the entire crew had gathered in the middle section of the ship to dine. One man in the aft cockpit was mortally wounded and died 24 hours later. The propeller of the transport was torn off, but the escort ships had to sink it. After that, the submarines paid off the ships that were hunting for them. For two hours rattled bursts of underwater bombs, but then Somalia, one of the destroyers involved in the hunt, was hit by a torpedo right in the engine room. Five men died and several more were wounded. The destroyer stood shrouded in smoke while rescue crews gathered around. The damage was severe but not fatal, so it was decided to attempt to tow the destroyer. The Lord Middleton approached the side of the Somalia. Radar operator Arthur Jones recalls. We began taking in various supplies and personal belongings of the crew. At the same time, everything that could be dropped without too much trouble was flying overboard. Shells, depth bombs, and so on. The ship had to be lightened as much as possible. We had been standing at the side of the destroyer for about 20 minutes when suddenly the hatch of the aft engine room opened and one mechanic came up from there. Maybe he was concussed, I don't know. Only he went to the opposite side and jumped to another rescue vessel that came up to the destroyer. Only some of the crew remained aboard the Somalia, and it was taken in tow by the U.S. Ashanti, a destroyer of the same type. Ironically, this torpedo was intended for the Ashanti, which had swapped places with the Somali shortly before the attack. Our nerves were strained to the limit, during the day three vessels were torpedoed, but the ASDIC failed to detect the attacking boats. As a final blow in the midst of the submarine hunt, followed the order to the aircraft carrier and its escorting destroyers to leave the convoy. The same order was given to the cruiser Scylla. Again there was a terrifying feeling that at the most desperate moment the fleet is abandoning us. The sailors' comments were varied and colourful. We did not know the reasons for this order. The pilots of the Avengers Swordfish had been flying continuously since PQ-18 had put to sea and were now exhausted to the utmost. Therefore, with the danger of a massive attack gone, it was decided to let them rest. The valuable aircraft carrier was withdrawn from the area concentration of enemy submarines around the slow-moving convoy. Likewise, it was decided not to put the cruiser under attack as well, 
At the time, we could not properly evaluate these decisions of Admiral Barnett. All of us and our exhausted guests saw one thing. The warships were once again rapidly disappearing over the horizon. Admiral Barnett moved to one of the remaining destroyers. He asked the Coast Guard to organize air cover for the convoy, and everyone began to look hopefully at the sky, awaiting the arrival of their planes. As darkness fell, the tension increased. In the dark, it is especially unpleasant to know that you are being hunted by submarines. On the morning of September 21, it became clear that the herring was still dragging behind us, but then came a single Catalina. She flew over the convoy and contacted the Commodore by searchlight, then began an anti-submarine patrol. Two hours later, she returned after flying in front of the convoy and landed on the water a mile away. It soon became clear that the seaplane was sinking. The tail of the plane rose into the air and all five crewmen went to the wing. The destroyer hurriedly lowered a dinghy to retrieve them. We learned that the Catalina had spotted and attacked the submarine, but was hit herself. That was the end of the story of the convoy's air cover. Shortly thereafter, at enough thin, a periscope was sighted just 200 yards from the Pozoriki's bow. The depth bomb bursts rumbled on until dark, the convoy barely crawling along at five knots, with the Somalia falling further and further behind. This situation could not last indefinitely, and it did not last long. At dawn on September 22, the sea quieted down and the sky cleared of clouds and even herrings. One of the destroyers left us, taking Admiral Barnett to Scylla. As soon as he was gone, we felt a familiar jolt on the Lord Austin, and we looked anxiously around the ships. A column of water had risen off the side of a large transport. Soon we felt five more tremors. The water fountains rose so fast that we could not make out which vessels had been hit. The bells of a loud battle rang, and our rescued men began to jump out of the hatch onto the deck like devils from a snuffbox. One of the air defence ships sped up and raced along the convoy of transports, but we feared that its twin had caught a fish. That would have been a hell of a failure. It was good that we were already close to the target, so even such a blow would not be too felt. But it wasn't the air defence ship that was hit, it was its nearest neighbour, the ocean voice leading the left column. Once again, Commodore Dowding's ship began to sink. This was fired by a submarine on the right bow of the convoy. The Ocean Freedom, which was leading the right column, was just behind its proper place at the time, so the first torpedo passed under its nose and struck the voice. There was a tremendous flash, an explosion, and the nose of the transport was thrown upward. Three days before, one of the Russian women on the ship had given birth to a baby. Immediately after the torpedo hit, the baby was put in a suitcase as they thought it would be safer. But then a second torpedo hit the bow of the ship, destroying the compartment where the passengers were housed, and the suitcase disappeared. Several people later claimed to have seen the waves carry the baby through a huge hole in the side of the ocean voice. The ship did not sink, but lost power completely. So the Zamalek went to it to remove the crew. Meanwhile, the remaining torpedoes hit the Grey Ranger and the American transport Bellingham. Palomar's was saved by a miracle when the Ranger was damaged. The officer of the watch, sensing something wrong, ordered full ahead. The air defence ship sharply increased the stroke, and the torpedo passed so close Aston that the men in the engine room heard the noise of its propellers. The Ranger took a hit in the stern. The torpedo passed through the buoyancy tank into the engine room, killing three men. Three deck crewmen were also killed. In the explosion, just like in the movies, the wheel of the helm flew from the bridge into the air. The Bellingham then shuddered from the explosion and began to land rapidly stern to stern. We were ordered to stay alongside of it. We stalled the cars, and the sailors of the transport swam toward us. In a few moments, we were already helping them up to our dick. Well, guys, thanks. This is getting to be a bad habit. This is the fifth time I've drowned since we left Iceland, one of them said. Fortunately, none of them were injured and only one person was missing. As we helped them aboard and hauled in the coveted food crates the sailors had brought with them, the Bellingham rose higher and higher above us.
the bow of the vessel was sticking out of the water at an angle of about 60 degrees. It was an awesome sight, especially from so close up. There was something majestic about the demise of a huge vessel. In just a couple of minutes it sank, leaving behind only a foaming maelstrom of swirling debris and flashing light boys. It was the funeral pyre of the last of the lost transports of the PQ-17 convoy. Our rescue efforts lasted about half an hour. All this time we stood still. The convoy had gone far ahead, and we were a perfect target for submarines prowling nearby. It was the longest half hour of my life. When the ocean voice was hit, Vice Commodore Walker, commanding the Transport Ocean Freedom, took command of the convoy. I had time to see Commodore Dowding standing on the bridge, threaten me with his fist as I hoisted the Commodore's braid pennant. The Zamalek picked up most of the Russians, including women and children. They were assigned a special compartment on the crowded rescue ship, except for a grief-stricken mother whose child was missing and another woman with a broken leg. The rest got off very, very lightly. The crew of The Voice took off the minesweeper Sigal, on which and finished the campaign, Dording, now being in the tail of the convoy, recalls Captain Walker. Later, the Commodore made a couple of attempts to get on board, but the excitement was strong. I offered to leave the formation and lie adrift so that he would come over to us, but Dowding did not agree. I suppose he was thinking more of the ships than of his own comfort. The voice was later sunk by one of the escort ships. The engine room of the Grey Ranger was severely damaged and flooded, so the surviving sailors were ordered to abandon ship. Most of them got into the port side cutter and were picked up by the trawler Noffin Gem. A few were rescued by the Ratlin. A young mechanic who jumped overboard from the stern of the tanker was thrown a line from one of the rescue boats. He managed to catch the line, but the ship did not have time to slow down and dragged the man along for a mile. The mechanic half suffocated before he was brought aboard. He was only 20 years old. An older man would not have survived the terrible ordeal of the icy water. The ranger was almost out of fuel, but could not be towed. The abandoned tanker could well have been captured by the Germans, so the escort ship sank it. However, the ship was so solidly built that it had to be shot down for a full 30 minutes. And then it was all over. The enemy never attacked us again. The crew of the Austin had to take care of more than 50 new passengers and their pet cats and husky puppies. We again faced the difficult problem of how to house and feed them, although the Nuff and Gem was in a much more difficult position than we were. On this trawler, the sailors from the leader, the ranger, and a few men from the Bellingham were gathered together. The compartments were crammed so that there was no room to turn around. The meager rations consisted of tinned sausage, biscuits, and tea, but they were decreasing daily, although some food had been transferred from the destroyer to the trawler. The same thing was happening on the Ruthlin. In addition to the crew, he had on board about 200 people. Many rescued suffered from nervous shock and refused to go below. Therefore, the deck of the Ratlin resembled a river steamer on a tour. The rest of the day and all night we were followed by two few W2 200 Condor Scouts, but the convoy persistently followed on. At dawn we played the battle alarm, and for two hours we followed in a zigzag pattern, but Condors persistently hovered on our tail. Where were our planes? But as we were in relative safety not far from our minefields, no new attacks followed. In the afternoon we saw Iceland, but for some reason plans changed and most of the ships were diverted to Lock U. We were caught in a blizzard and the wind increased to a gale. At this point we were required to turn, although the ship stopped obeying the rudder. Turn when you're ready, the captain commanded from the bridge. He's yawing twenty degrees both ways, replied the helmsman. Then turn when he calms down, followed the dry reply. As the gale was just terrible, we began to fear that the overcrowded Ratlin would capsize. He separated from us to go into Sadie's Field for supplies and then followed the convoy. The long-suffering Winston Salem fell behind due to rudder trouble. Every ship was battered by the storm. The Dianella experienced the nastiest moment of the entire voyage, sailor Kenneth Richard recalls. We were swept over the port side and capsized. 
I was sitting in a chair in the deckhouse, and at what angle we tilted, I can't tell you. But I was looking straight down into the water, and it lasted an eternity. I could hear the chief mate yelling to the helmsman, Don't touch the rudder under any circumstances. The starboard scuppers flooded, and the deck was covered with her. But by some miracle the ship straightened out, and thank God it did. The storm subsided, and in the sudden calm we passed through an area where seals were frolicking and mines were floating. The fortresses, Sunderlands, and Wheatleys were scurrying back and forth in the sky. They appeared when they were no longer needed. The destroyers had left us, but now a coastal escort came up to us. An order was sent to Captain Walker, Ocean Freedom from the Seagull. Come forward and lead them home. I wish I could be with you all the way. Tell all ships, well done. We spotted Butt of Levis. The BBC radio told us that the return convoy had arrived safely, but behind us, the final tragedy played out. Somalia was slowly creeping forward on a tug from the Ashanti, constantly pumping out water that threatened to swamp the destroyer. The ship was left with an incomplete crew of 80 men. Although all the lifeboats were destroyed, the remaining life rafts were enough for everyone to be rescued if necessary. But a fierce storm struck, and in the darkness of night, the ship completed its arduous journey. Towing became increasingly dangerous, so the crew was ordered to stay on the upper deck. Sailor Arthur Jones of the Lord Middleton Recall his bow light was seen thrashing from side to side in the wildest manner. Suddenly the tow rope snapped, and at the same moment there was a loud metallic scraping sound. The destroyer broke in two, and the two halves began to drift in different directions. It sank very quickly. Since the swell was very strong, our skipper decided to keep to windward. If the sailors jumped overboard, they would be swept toward us. We were able to save very few. The strong current carried the rest past us, and that was death. I fear that these unfortunates never had a chance. Among those who were miraculously pulled from the water was the commander of the Somalia. He had already lost the creature, but was hoisted onto the Ashanti trotting around. But more than forty of the Somalia's crew died, including those who were lifted from the cold water too late. The destroyer's signalman Petty Officer died aboard the Middleton shortly after the rescue. He was buried at sea inside his fjord, at the very end of the voyage. Eke, September 26, 1942. We are standing in Loch U. The next day the Winston-Salem came crawling in. We later heard that the ironclad had managed to reach Sabobard and later arrived in England. So the bare numbers, two British and five American transports, survived from the PQ-17 convoy, two more salvage ships. Two blasted Russian tankers being repaired in Arkhangelsk. Sad to say about all of this. We had brought home about a thousand people. They now had a short trip on a coaster steamer to Glasgow, where they would be given a grand reception and dinner. They would then be given a pleasant rest until they recovered sufficiently to put to sea again. The Americans had yet to cross the Atlantic. All of us preferred to keep quiet. Military secrecy. Despite the thundering claims of German propaganda and hundreds of all sorts of rumours, there was no official communique, statement or anything of the sort. The whole story carried a bitter flavour. Over the Royal Navy hung the unpleasant accusation that it cowardly fled after a panicked Admiralty order. All this was without precedent in naval history. We brought home our memories, like Medical Lieutenant McCallum of the Zamalek, who complained for a very long time that as soon as he closed his eyes he could immediately see the Blom and Foss circling on the horizon. It's like the chief mechanic of the same ship Dawson, who, having come ashore, found out that he had lost about 15 kilograms and became like a skeleton. The whistling of the bombs and the screams of the rescued men were constantly in his ears, like Gunner Herbert Warmby of the Ocean Freedom, who from then on began to offer a prayer of thanksgiving every night for the miraculous rescue. On board the Palomares, which was bound for Belfast, it was learned from a radio report that another convoy had broken through to Russia with a fight, thanks to the help of the Royal Air Force. Never had such foul swearing been heard on that ship as after this report. But that was the last outburst of anger we experienced. In the immediate aftermath of the disaster, 
convoy PQ-17 went down in history as one of the most tragic episodes of the war. It was the most crushing defeat suffered by Allied convoys. However, lessons were immediately learned from it, and its demise was quickly avenged as all subsequent convoys arrived in Russia. At the same time, it should be recalled that the fate of the PUC-17 convoy and the mistakes that led to its defeat immediately covered a thick veil of secrecy. In this respect, the story of PQ-17 differs sharply from that of other convoys. We arrived at Lok Yu on September 26, 1942. The same day we read in the newspapers a lengthy and colourful Admiralty communique about the great battle that Pee Wee Teen endured. During the battle 40 enemy planes were destroyed and most of the transports reached their destination safely. At the end of the communique, four paragraphs were devoted to the QP-14 crossing. They mentioned the loss of several ships and briefly mentioned the loss of the minesweeper leader and the destroyer Somalia and not a word about the PQ-17 convoy. Likewise, there was no mention of the convoy during the time we were away, not until August 4 when a few pictures appeared in the newspapers. These were pictures of a battle with torpedo carriers on Independence Day, exactly one month earlier. The notice referred to one of the largest convoy battles at sea and a huge unconvoy. Here's an example of the carefully censored caption under the Daily Herald photo. These dramatic images show a raid by German torpedo carrier planes on a convoy to Russia. The ships followed the Arctic route early last month, when there was hardly any darkness at all, and good visibility helped the enemy. Despite repeated attacks, the convoy with the most important military cargoes broke through. However, in all neutral countries by this time circulated German statements about the sinking of many ships with specific names. For propaganda purposes, the Germans circulated pictures taken by submarines and airplanes showing sinking ships and helpless sailors. In America, on the same day, August 4, Life magazine published a large selection of photographs of the Independence Day events. They were taken by one of the staff officers stationed on the U.S. Wainwright. The destroyer was not named, only mentioned as one of the U.S. warships guarding a large caravan of U.N. merchant ships. Life was not censored as harshly as British newspapers. The article stated, German radio reports say the enemy has sunk an American cruiser and 28 merchant ships, the greatest catastrophe in the history of war at sea. They claim that planes sank 122,000 tons with another 70,000 tons sunk by submarines. The next statement added four more merchant ships and the next one added three more. On July 9, the Russians declared that the convoy had arrived safely in a Russian Arctic port. It had suffered losses, but large quantities of American and British airplanes, tanks, guns, food, medicine, and other military supplies had been delivered to the stranded Russians. They have traveled the longest distance from the factory to the front line. Reif added that the actual Allied losses had not been made public, but they were undoubtedly far lower than the extravagant claims of the Germans. The Admiralty continued to maintain a sepulchral silence. A few months later, in the spring of 1943, Lord Winster, who had been a naval officer, caused an uproar in the House of Lords when he demanded an explanation for the worst campaign in the world. The next day, the Daily Express rose. Lord Winster reported that one of our convoys to Polar Russia had lost 34 ships out of 38. Apparently, he was speaking of the most serious defeat of an allied convoy, which took place early in July. The enemy claimed to have destroyed the entire convoy, carrying more than 250,000 tons of aircraft, tanks, ammunition and food. Official German sources reported the sinking of 19 ships by airplanes, and another nine by submarines in the Spitsburg area. All other ships were destroyed in pursuit in the following two days, when they were already near their port of destination. After heavy air attacks and heavy losses, the convoy turned north on July 2 to evade a German squadron that included the Tirpitz. It was again attacked by bombers on the approaches to Arkhangelsk. Submarines killed the retired and damaged ships. Only four transports were saved. Only now the facts about the actual fate of the convoy began to leak out. 
but the Admiralty continued to keep silent. A few months later, Fleet Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, First Sea Lord and Chief of Naval Staff, resigned due to illness. He passed away that same year, 1943. But even after his death, not a single report of the PQ-17 convoy appeared. The vow of silence was not broken until February 1945. That month, the Swedish ship Gripsholm arrived in New York with the first group of American sailors to return home after three years in German camps. Among them were 25 men from the ships of the PQ-17 convoy. They kept all their bitter memories and recounted them to the jubilant townspeople. It became known that the powerful escort force, including cruisers and destroyers, had thrown the merchant ships to the mercy of German planes and submarines as they swarmed after the German battleships. The stories of the sailors of the Carlton and Honomu were especially grim. Ordinary Americans could not believe that all these horrors were really happening. Sailors said that 34 out of 38 merchant ships had been sunk. Some openly accused the Royal Navy of cowardice. The Limey fleet just turned around and ran away. The US headlines created quite a furor, especially since most of the ships in the convoy were American. The US Navy Department refused to comment on the reports, so the British Admiralty had to take the blame. The story is being hushed up by Admiralty officials, but Navy officers are unofficially calling it real nonsense. In cases like this, if a convoy is attacked, it is disbanded. At that time, the escort ships try to repel the attack, so the officers tell us. To two days. While passions boiled over, the Admiralty did nothing. Then it issued a communique to correct inaccurate reports that had recently appeared. It consisted of a summary of the actions of the line fleet, cruisers and destroyers. It also stated the exact number of transports in the convoy and the correct number of ships sunk. However, it erroneously stated that five transports were sunk in an air raid on Independence Day. The communique made only cursory mention of the order to disperse the convoy and stated that a few hours after the battle, with the torpedo carriers, the convoy proceeded to the target without further opposition. Later, when on the parallel of Cape Nordcap an attack by enemy surface ships seemed imminent, the convoy was ordered to disperse. Six destroyers joined the first cruiser squadron to form a balanced strike force. An anxious 24 hours followed, but the enemy ships did not attack the dispersed transports. This intention was probably abandoned due to the disbandment of the convoy. The last statement can be considered a classic. It said nothing about the fact that during these very 24 hours submarines and airplanes sent to the bottom 14 scattered transports. In conclusion, the communique cheerfully assert. During the past 42 months, our Russian ally has received no less than 91.6 of the huge amount of military cargoes sent by the northern route. And most of the way the transports have been under the cover of British ships. New York Times, as well as other American newspapers, simply reprinted this communique without any comment. Out of the darkness of the past, some unpleasant figures released by the British Admiralty have come to light. It is only now that we realize how heavy the losses we suffered then. And again there was silence. Nearly two more years passed, but not even the remotest hint that mistakes had been made in the conduct of this convoy operation was allowed. Then in October 1948, the Russian newspaper Red Fleet, the official organ of the Soviet Navy, published two incisive articles by Captain Second Rank V. E. Andreev, entitled Lessons of One Convoy, these articles unleashed a barrage of criticism on the Admiralty, openly accusing it of having given the order to disband the convoy unnecessarily. Andreev stated, the main reason for the dispersal of the convoy seems to have been the confusion in the minds of the British commanders, the exaggerated fear of German ships, the fear of losses in battleships that might have occurred. Andreev said that naval traditions required escort ships to protect merchant ships. In this case, the traditions were forgotten. As a result, after the dispersal, when the transports were left defenseless, the convoy suffered the heaviest losses. The order to disperse was given when the enemy ship supposedly threatening the convoy was still 300 miles away. Andreev accused the Admiralty of not taking seriously enough the organization of the convoy. 
Every dog in Reykjavik knew about its departure, which allowed the Germans to carefully prepare the attack. The convoy had an insufficient escort, which should have included an aircraft carrier. Andreev mentioned the irresponsibility and panic that characterized the British and American commands. Ships were abandoned after the first minor damage. Andreev gave a lot of details, although not all of his information was accurate. It quite unfairly blamed the order to disperse the convoy on the Commodore and escort commander. At the same time, he gave the correct number of ships in the convoy. The number of transports sunk and correctly reported that only 11 transports, including the two damaged Russian tankers, had arrived in Arkhangelsk. He quoted the reply that the captain of the Azerbaijan received from a British destroyer that came to the tanker's aid. The convoy will not be reformed. Save yourself independently. I advise you to keep as far north as the ice will allow. Good luck. The New York Times reprinted Andreev's articles in full. A new scandal had begun in England. Anthony Eden, who had been foreign secretary during the war, publicly stated, any honest ally should have considered the Admiralty Communique's issue during the last two years before drawing conclusions about such a complex and risky operation. As it was, they were completely forgotten. It seems to me that our ally is behaving, to put it mildly, ungenerously by choosing the fate of a single convoy as a pretext for blame. In the House of Commons, members of Parliament declared the fervent indignation felt by all Britons in the wake of Andreev's outrageous statements. Mr. John Dugdale, Secretary of the Admiralty, said he did not accept the articles because they revealed a complete misunderstanding of the laws of naval tactics, but also utterly denied the courage of the British and American seamen on the convoy ships. He assured MPs that a new Admiralty statement would soon be prepared and published at home and abroad. The statement emphasised the extraordinary success of the 40 Arctic convoys. Leaving escort ships alongside damaged and straggling vessels was, in the Admiralty's view, an unnecessary mortal risk. The only course of action in such a situation was to remove the crew and scuttle the ship. Regarding the dispersal of the convoy, the statement reiterated once again that on the parallel of Cape Nordcap, an attack by enemy surface ships seemed inevitable. The convoy had already travelled too far east for Admiral Tevez's line fleet to assist it, so the Admiralty ordered the convoy to disperse and the cruisers and destroyers to withdraw to form a balanced strike formation that could distract the enemy. This is a recognised method of defence in such extreme circumstances. In any case, the actions of the escort ships and the dispersal of the convoy achieved their main objective. The enemy heavy ships turned back and so the convoy escaped destruction. So were the British actions a success? Another fresh thought for future historians. A day later, however, Pravda published a brief article in support of the Admiralty's position. It expressed confidence in the undoubted courage shown by the American and British fleets in conducting the convoys. The article emphasised that this opinion was supported by awards to British and American sailors. Andreev's articles were called extremely unsuccessful. He took the wrong approach. Instead of studying the experience of many operations, Andreev began to make generalizations based on one operation that was unsuccessful. Red Fleet reprinted Pravda's rebuttal, but protested that a number of foreign journalists had used Andreev's statements to foment an anti-Soviet campaign. At this point, everything temporarily quieted down. It took another four years before, in October 1950, the Admiralty published Admiral Tovey's reports on the Russian convoys in full in a supplement to the London Gazette. The press clung to them because they presented a very different picture than had hitherto been imagined. It transpired that the Commander-in-Chief of the Metropolitan Fleet had repeatedly asked for an increased escort of convoys. He demanded a reduction in the number of convoys during the summer until the ice boundary retreated northward. They cited numerous requests to the Russians for assistance, especially during the final stage of the crossing, virtually all of which went unanswered. The Russians constantly demanded more effort, but did not help in any way. The bombing of Norwegian airfields promised by the Russians was never carried out. Literally on every page of Tovey's reports, one could find references to the lack of interaction with the Kremlin. 
regarding some of the details concerning the memorable PQ-17 disaster. The Daily Express stated, Admiral Tovey remained silent for eight years, even though Parliament accused him of calling off destroyers to cover his battleships. All the manoeuvres of the line fleet were now known. It was cruising west of the area bounded by the islands of Jan Mayan, Spitsbergen and Medvegi, where Admiral Tovey thought a tips attack was most likely. When naval intelligence suggested that enemy ships might attack the convoy east of Medvegi Island, the commander-in-chief suggested to the Admiralty that the convoy be turned back at 12.18 hours, when it would reach longitude 10 day O. In this case, the enemy could be within range of Tovey's ships. This proposal was rejected. Tovey was therefore left with no choice but to patrol in the area indicated to him. On July 3, it was reported that the Tirpitz and Hipper had left Trondheim. Admiral Hamilton then decided to move with his cruisers east of Bear Island. On the same day, aerial reconnaissance found that the ice boundary had moved northward, and the Admiralty transmitted to the captain that the convoy was advised to pass at least 50 miles north of Medvegiego. However, Captain Second Rank Broom preferred to follow the former course in poor visibility. Still, Admiral Hamilton decided that the northern course was more favourable, so he approached the convoy and ordered Broom to change course to pass 70 miles north of Medvegiego and then increase the distance from the enemy airfields to 400 miles. At midnight on July 4, the Admiralty authorised Hamilton to proceed with the cruisers to 25 degged. ONS the situation required it or special orders from the Commander-in-Chief were received. Tovey wrote, This was a change in the methodology I had agreed upon with the Admiralty. As I had no information to justify this change, I ordered Hamilton to turn back when the convoy reached 25 degged O or earlier, unless the Admiralty gave assurances that he would not meet the Tirpitz. After seven hours, the Admiralty radioed Hamilton that new information was expected shortly, and he was to remain with the convoy until new instructions. And then, two hours later, three fateful radiograms were sent, and this was done over the Commander-in-Chief's head. The last one was sent to correct the wording from disperse to disperse, but no one knew that at the time. The radiograms were taken by Admiral Hamilton, and Captain Second Rank Broom as clear evidence that the Tirpitz was chasing the convoy. Broom therefore turned his destroyers back to engage. On July 5 at 17.0, the Russian submarine Red Star reported that the Tirpitz with escort ships was detected near Cape Nordcap. After 3.5 hours, another submarine followed the report, but shortly thereafter the enemy ships broke off the chase and turned back for unknown reasons. On the night of July 5-6, the Admiralty sent Admiral Tovey three radiograms. They stated that if the line fleet was seen heading east, the Tirpitz would not attempt to attack the convoy. Red Star could well damage it, so victorious planes would have a chance to attack the German battleship. Admiral Tovey did not think so, but on July 6 at 18.45 refueling destroyers, he did turn to the northeast. When, an hour later, a German airplane flew above the squadron above cloud level. He tried to attract the enemy's attention by opening fire and bringing up fighters, but had no success. Later in the day he was joined by Hamilton's cruisers. Since the weather was not favourable for aerial reconnaissance, Tovey turned southwest and the ships returned to port. All of the Admiral's actions were clearly explained but who exactly was behind the Admiralty orders that conflicted with those of the Commander-in-Chief, who overruled Tovey's orders, whose fateful decision was the reason for sending the three fateful radiograms, area on whose orders was the convoy disbanded, and on what grounds. Admiral Tovey would not tell the newspapers. He stated, I could say a great deal more, but perhaps I had better not. The silence of official circles continued for another seven years. Only in 1957, 15 years after that fateful day, the truth became known. All these years spread the most incredible rumours. Many bitter suspicions were born, and then everything was revealed. In the second volume of his work War at Sea, the official historian of the Admiralty, 
Captain First Rank Stephen Riskill wrote that the man who overruled Tuve's orders, the man who gave the decisive order to scatter the PU-17 convoy, was Fleet Admiral Sir Dudley Pound. For the first time it was recognised, officially and publicly, that this order was a grave mistake. Eke dear. The sailors of the convoy hardly knew the name of the First Sea Lord. Unlike the commanders of the other two branches of the armed forces, he remained a mysterious, vague figure, standing in the shadows behind the Admiralty. This was despite the fact that Pound had been First Sea Lord since the beginning of the war. What kind of man was this? He was sixty-four years old, most of which he had spent in the Navy. Pound had participated in the famous Battle of Jutland, but he was never widely known to the personnel. In one of the extremely rare occasions when a newspaper attempted to give his portrait on the eve of Pound's death, the day of the Battle of Trafalgar in 1943, the Daily Mail roll. Day after day this man, who had done Britain's most important work for four of its most important years, telephoned his wife. I'm sorry, but I can't come home today, he would say. I understand, Lady Pound replied. The Pounds lived in a furnished apartment in Haunton Street, Kensington, paying six guineas a week. But after the war it became known that Sir Dudley kept a 24-hour watch at the Admiralty, fifty yards from his large and deserted study. Hung with maps was an equally modest bedroom with cream-coloured walls. Only a simple iron bed with a straw mattress indicated the purpose of this room. Even the mahogany chest of personal belongings was littered with blank radiograms and various books, like a codex of signals. It was in this austere environment that Sir Dudley Pound lived. If there was any collision in the channel at night, he was raised out of bed. Events around the convoy to Arkhangelsk forced him to stay awake for 24 hours. He had to go to his office before he had time to take off his robe to answer phone calls, give crucial advice, make decisions, dictate orders. Sometimes he would go to bed without undressing, because he knew that in just an hour or two he would have to return to his duties, since no one could replace him. When Lady Pound's health began to fail, he tried to go home in the evenings. But he managed to spend the night at home no more than four times a year, so he gave up luncheon to be able to be with his wife. He never came to lunch, instead Pound drove to Kensington. He could never stay there for more than an hour. After that he would go back to his work. In late 1940, Admiral Pound was severely criticised in the House of Commons for the methods by which the Admiralty directed operations. This was not the only time he came under fire, but he also weathered this storm raised by his opponents. It was Pound who commanded the Royal Navy during the first, hardest years of the war. His main flaw, according to the officers who worked with him, was his desire to keep everything under his personal control. Pound did not want to give too much will to subordinate commanders. According to the official historian, he was too prone to control squadrons and fleets from the bridge of his flagship and from Whitehall. His interference in the actions of the fleets was excessive. The Admiralty spoke out strongly against sending PU-17 during a polar day, when intelligence reported the enemy's intention to launch a massive attack on the convoy by aircraft, submarines, and surface ships, which could have resulted in exceptionally heavy casualties. Admiral Pound decided that the greatest danger was the Terps and its escort. He had two weeks before the convoy left to assess the situation. Therefore, the decision to disperse the convoy was carefully thought out, and prepared in advance. Vice Admiral B.B. B. Schofield, who is involved in the preparation of the Russian convoys, has recently stated this very clearly. In his book Russian Convoys, published in 1964, which brilliantly describes all the details of convoy operations and enemy actions, Admiral Schofield writes, When Admiral Tuve learned that PQ-17, like the previous convoy, would consist of 35 ships, he suggested to the First Sea Lord that the convoy be divided into two parts. At the same time, Tovey emphasised that he still considered large convoys undesirable. During a telephone conversation with Pound on this issue, Tovey first learned that Pound proposed to dissolve the convoy. If it in the Barents Sea will be attacked by a German squadron, which includes the Tirpitz, 
Ordering a convoy to disperse is a standard move in naval warfare if the convoy is attacked by enemy ships outnumbering the escort. The British used it successfully when a convoy of 37 ships, escorted by a single auxiliary cruiser Jervis Bay, was attacked in the middle of the Atlantic by the pocket battleship Admiral Shear. But in the Barents Sea the situation was quite different. There the transports simply had nowhere to hide, as pack ice prevented them from getting beyond the reach of German coastal aviation. Moreover, experience showed that mutual support is especially important in repelling attacks by aircraft and submarines. Therefore, Admiral Pound's proposal as a thunderbolt struck to Vey. July 3 came the news that Tirpitz and Hipper left Trondheim. Although bad weather hampered aerial reconnaissance, by the evening of July 4, the Admiralty was assured that the pair were headed for a connection with the Sheer at Alton Fjord, near Nordcap. They were probably at this point already heading northeast to attack the convoy. Admiral Tovey's line fleet was 350 miles behind. It could have been ordered to go full speed to help the convoy, but that was time consuming. In addition, the only aircraft carrier of the Metropolitan Fleet could be hit by numerous German planes. Cruisers, on the other hand, were considered incapable of fighting a battleship. To quote Admiral Schofield again, it is quite obvious that the first Sea Lord thought most of the threat of the Tirpitz attack. He considered it the most serious of the three. Bad weather might have saved the convoy from air attack. The polar day seriously hampered the submarines, but only fog could help in attacking surface ships. As mentioned, Pound had long pondered this situation, long before it actually happened, and had long ago concluded that disbanding the convoy would be the most correct solution. Although almost all of the participants in the meeting he held were against it, Pound did not find their arguments convincing enough for them to make him change his mind. When everyone in the meeting had spoken, he closed his eyes for a moment, mulling something over, then turned to the communications chief. Tell the cruisers to withdraw to the west at full speed. Convoy to disperse. In all his long and distinguished service, Admiral Pound had never made such a fateful decision. In fact, at the time this radiogram was sent, on the evening of July 4, Tira Pitts and the rest of the German ships stood in Alton Field. They did not put to sea until noon the next day. Today it is generally believed that the convoy was disbanded prematurely. Why Admiral Pound acted so swiftly on the basis of more than scanty intelligence information is still a mystery. He did not wait for new information on the movements of the Tirpitz, although it was clear that the scattered merchant ships would be easy prey for aircraft and submarines. Disbanding the convoy was bound to result in heavy casualties. Why then did Pound decide to expose them to mortal danger before the real danger from surface ships was confirmed? As all military men know very well, intelligence can be of great benefit in operations, but it never becomes a decisive factor, and it certainly is not one in the presence of doubt. Here it is useful to mention the name of Vice Admiral Sir Norman Denning, one of the founders of the Naval Intelligence Service. In August 1965, the Sunday Telegraph newspaper stated, it was Denning who created the technique of identifying and tracking German raiders sent to various parts of the globe. This technique helped to destroy most of them, including the Graf Spee. Had his advice been heeded, Sir Dudley Pound's disastrous order to the PQ-17 convoy to disperse because of the threat of attack by surface ships would never have been given. But the order was given, and it set off a chain reaction that was impossible to stop. All ships acted as ordered and the escort ships acted in accordance with normal practice. One of the most remarkable details that emerged while working on this book was the deep-seated feelings of the sailors serving on the escort destroyers at the time. This deep-seated feeling became even deeper after the hasty accusations of cowardice and treason fell away. Not abandoning the convoy, as they had done, they had acted against their own wishes. They had endeavoured with, with all their souls to protect the merchant ships. When they turned to meet the enemy near over the horizon, they were convinced they had done the right thing. The moment the truth became known to them, they were horrified. Officers who met with the author while the book was being written offered the logbooks of their ships, 
which described their subsequent actions, and in this they saw at least some justification for their actions on that black day. Captain Second Rank Broom clearly expressed his feelings, which were shared by all the sailors of his flotilla, when it became clear that the enemy ships would never appear. The rapidly increasing distance from the convoy began to cause us unpleasant doubts. Had we really assessed the situation correctly? Was everything going according to plan? Very soon consciousness was pierced by an icy needle, far colder than all the Arctic ice combined. We have used up so much fuel that we can no longer return to the convoy. The doubts, vague and uncertain at first, it became clear in an instant. I will never forget to the end of my life the minute when the radiograms of transports attacked by submarines and airplanes began to come in. Something completely wrong had happened. The faith that had sustained us so far was instantly shattered. I radioed the ad that I was ready and could return, but it was too late. When the details of the PQ-17 defeat became known, people completely unrelated to the convoy started several independent investigations. The author is fully prepared to subscribe to the sharp rebuke of the escort commander. After the disaster, accusations and criticism began. Moreover, most of our accusers tried to launder the high command. Historians, willingly or unwillingly, continue to add fuel to the fire, but since I remain one of the central figures in the problem, I must say that I have never seen anything dubious or controversial in what happened. PQ-17 might well have turned to be just another unremarkable convoy that arrived at its destination without much adventure, had it not been for these Admiralty radiograms. The order given in the last of them should either have been obeyed or forgotten. To my utmost regret, I obeyed it. In doing so, I set in motion a chain of events which Admiral Tovey agreed was entirely inevitable, given the usual practices of the Navy. The eleven ships reached Arkhangelsk. What the results would have been had the convoy not been disbanded, no one can say. But taking into account the fact that the Tirpitz was considered a sacred cow at that moment, the outcome could hardly have been worse. Therefore, responsibility for all that happened must lie with the man who gave the order and his advisers. The same opinion was expressed by an officer serving on the destroyer offer, part of the Keppel flotilla. Lieutenant W.W.D. O'Brien recalled, that the commander of the offer was very close to turning back to join the convoy. But today, Admiral O'Brien sigh, I have never been able to celebrate Independence Day with my American friends, because the 4th of July remains in my memory the most bitter day for me. I feel sorry for the fallen sailors of the PQ-17. It is one of the most shameful episodes in the history of the Royal Navy, when warships abandon transports to their fate. Put simply, we forgot our duty. For me, the story of PQ-17 has become a classic lesson, although in general it is far from a new lesson. Any military operation is jeopardized when the supreme authority, in this case the Admiralty, takes over the tactical direction of ships through the heads of commanders on the scene. In the case of PQ-17, this error was compounded by the Admiralty's failure to pass the information it had to these commanders. It did not even explain the reasons that led to the sending of the three dramatic radiograms. I am sure, and have always been sure, that these three radiograms were erroneous in intent and in substance. The commander-in-chief of the Metropolitan Fleet was responsible for the planning and execution of the operation. Admiral Hamilton, who had a strong cruiser squadron at his disposal, was responsible for protecting the convoy from attack by surface ships. Captain Second Rank Broom was responsible for direct cover of the convoy. The surest course of action was to turn over to these commanders all available intelligence information and leave them to make tactical decisions. They were completely deprived of this right and put in the humiliating position of having to abandon the convoy. In doing so, they had no information as to whether such a terrible sacrifice was justified. I do not think I have reached such a serious conclusion purely in hindsight. There can be no doubt what would be the fate of merchant ships left alone on a perfectly calm sea in the face of an endless polar day. This order was in complete contradiction to the basic tenet that I firmly remembered. The best form of defence against any attack air, submarine or surface 
is for the convoy to remain in formation. It should be disbanded only in the event of a real attack by a superior surface force. Exactly the same feelings were experienced by the sailors of the cruiser formation. Aboard the cruiser Wichita was Lieutenant Douglas Fairbanks, who had served on Rear Admiral Robert C. Given staff on the Washington, he was temporarily transferred to the cruiser as an observer. Fairbanks describes the sailors' impressions after the cruisers departed and the convoy disbanded as follows. The first reaction was sheer shock. We all felt that a mistake had been made in transmitting the radiogram. The Americans spoke out particularly harshly. They cursed the British because they believed that they were fleeing, not wanting to engage in a battle in which we had every chance. We resented the fact that defenseless merchant ships were left to crawl at nine or ten knots through an icy sea in which a man could last only a few minutes. Two of the Wichita's pilots had already perished before we could get them out of the water. Our anger was further increased by the philosophical calm with which the merchant ships took the order and saw us off. Only then did it become clear that the battle was not going to start any time soon, and we headed for Scaper Flow. There we were able to meet with the crews of the British cruisers, and it became clear that they were as indignant as we were. I recall an exchange of signals between the London and the Wichita during which we were informed that the Germans had announced our sinking, and therefore we must be a ghost ship. To this the commander of the Wichita, Captain First Rank Hill, replied, We are so cold we cannot speak. But feelings can deceive, for we have been endeavouring all day to keep in your keel. In the officer's mess at Scaper, after a fair amount of beer, mutual recriminations began and many harsh words were spoken. In the end, everyone agreed to curse the Admiralty for its inability to assess the tactical situation by looking at a collection of flags on a map. Everything that had happened was considered a shameful defeat and the result of gross errors. The evil irony of events is that the Tirpitz did not put to sea until 15 hours after Pound gave the order to disband the convoy. It was later learned that it would not have left the harbour at all had the Allied heavy ships been detected. The Admiralty's concern for its battleships was no match for Hitler's desire to keep his remaining battleships intact. He was so afraid for them that he gave his admirals strictest orders not to engage even equal forces. German ships could only attack if they had decisive superiority. Had the Allies known this, they would have structured their naval strategy very differently. We now know everything about the Germans' plans. It was supposed to be a joint attack on the convoy by aircraft, submarines and ships, which was called Operation Rosshill Sprung Stroke of the Horse. Tirpitz, Hipper, Lutzo and Scheer together with ten destroyers were to attack the convoy, destroying the escort ships along the way. But only if the British Line fleet did not intervene, surface ships were to be assisted by submarines and selected squadrons, specially transferred from Sicily to Norway. However, Lutzo ran aground when leaving the harbour and three destroyers hit an underwater rock and damaged the propellers. Tirpitz, Hipper, Scheer and the remaining destroyers left Alton Fjord only at noon on July 5. But even after the enemy learned of the departure of Hamilton's cruisers, the German heavy ships ventured only a short sortie and fled back, fearing a collision with the British line fleet or Victory's aircraft. The threat of Victory's was constantly pressuring Hitler, which is why he was so slow to authorise the Tirpitz's withdrawal. In addition, German spy planes mistook the London and Norfolk for aircraft carriers. Late in the evening of July 5, when clearly outlined the success of the actions of aircraft and submarines, Tirpitz was withdrawn. At 9.30pm, the German battleship turned back. The two torpedo hits announced by Red Star did not exist in reality and had no effect whatsoever on the battleship's withdrawal. NEDT Disputes as to the actions of the various commanders continued to rage in the wardrooms for a very long time. But there were always a great many ifs. If the convoy had not been prematurely disbanded, what would have happened then? The British were firmly convinced that Admiral Tovey's line fleet could only fight the Germans if they were not supported by base aviation. 
The loss of Prince of Wales and Rip showed that skillful and determined pilots can sink a battleship. So the Admiralty considered it foolish to risk their battleships. If the enemy has as support for several hundred base aircraft, not to mention submarines, if only the Tirpitz, travelling westward, got out of range of the base planes, it would give the British an advantage of two battleships against one. Admiral Tove proposed two options. First, he wanted to send the convoy in two groups at some interval. Then he suggested temporarily turning the convoy westward to draw the enemy into the area. However, both proposals were rejected by the Admiralty as having serious disadvantages. In the first case, the enemy could attack each half of the convoy. In the second, the convoy would have to pass through an extremely dangerous area twice. The Germans, who aimed to prevent the delivery of supplies to Russia, would hardly have followed the convoy westward, straight into the jaws of the British fleet. After all, they knew for certain that British battleships were somewhere nearby. Instead, they could have simply waited until the convoy was back in the Barents Sea. Admiral Pound's main concern in the event of the Tirpitz going to sea was to save the warships. He deliberately sacrificed merchant ships. The authors do not consider themselves major strategists, but the facts, a stubborn thing. It is difficult to say how the fate of the convoy would have turned out if it had been disbanded later, when the attack really would have become inevitable. But on July 5, the convoy would have been much closer to Russian ports and Novaya Zemlya. And there was another problem, pointed out by all the sailors of the escort ships who helped the authors with the book. Let's assume that the PQ-17 convoy follows on as a unit, but if the Germans conduct another series of air raids as they did on D-Day, many ships will run out of ammunition. As a result, merchant ships would still be left unprotected. Now, it doesn't seem too likely that the Germans would be able to repeat such a strike, but, in any case, when the escort ships arrived in Arkhangelsk, it turned out that some already shot their ammunition to the last. Had the fleeing ships encountered any of the enemy ships that had been repeatedly warned about by radio? events might have taken a different turn. These mysterious radiograms, some of which the Lord Austin also received, remained a mystery. None of the warships was never seen, only to be reminded that once the Austin passed exactly through the place where the enemy squadron was supposedly located. However, all these secondary issues should not distract us from the main thing. The convoy was disbanded prematurely, and this was done over the heads of the commanders at sea. This has been proved unequivocally, and it is only a question of how deeply the next author wishes to bury the culprit. The second major complaint is the idiotic attempt by the Admiralty to keep these events secret for so many years. The mistakes were recognised too late to undo the damage they caused, and besides they were not widely publicised. The surviving sailors, their families and loved ones, and a host of others were unpleasantly overwhelmed by this veil of mystery. They asked the authors of the book the same sad questions. What really happened, and why? Why? Especially many publications appeared in America. The convoy sailors were saddened to see that there were arguments about some high matter, and no one wanted to remember the history of their sunken ships, limiting themselves to dry statistics. They listened with amazement to the ravings about ships, wading through storms and blizzards in total darkness, this in the middle of an Arctic summer. All these stories had nothing to do with reality and would be ridiculous if they were not insulting to the sailors. After all these stories, in addition, painted the exploits of the enemy. The enemy celebrated their victory over defenseless merchant ships in grand style, but this only drew chuckles from those who served on these transports. One of the sailors who had twice been on a torpedoed vessel said, they would rush to get rid of bombs and torpedoes to take pictures of us, and then rush home to take pictures of themselves when receiving their awards. In a way, that was exactly right. None of the naval battles involved so much photo and motion picture film. All the filming was done by the enemy and had to serve propaganda purposes. Admittedly, these pictures paid rich dividends here, but many years later they cause only a chuckle. The enemy's attempts to pass off their achievements as something amazing and heroic border on outright stupidity. The evidence is abundant. 
Four submarines chasing a single poorly armed transport. A single ship fends off submarine and airplane attacks for hours. The airplanes drop a fantastic number of bombs and make tremendous efforts to get even one direct hit. All of this directly indicates a lack of courage and skill. Only the torpedo attack on Independence Day looked different. But even there, the undoubted bravery of the squadron commander alone can be recognized. The rest of the pilots acted differently. When I published an article about Win Reet, it was written, Americans with interest watched as the German torpedo carriers go out to attack. Only the Nazi squadron commander broke through the barrage and earned the admiration of his opponents. The other German pilots preferred to turn and run away, dropping torpedoes at random. This was in no way reminiscent of the actions of American and Japanese pilots in the Pacific. Apparently, for 2.5 years of war, the Germans have lost their determination. When the remnants of the convoy on the way from the Strait of Matochkin Shah to the White Sea were subjected to a seven-hour attack by German bombers, its results were a real disappointment for the enemy. Only two ships were lost under the enormous amount of bombs, and they were sunk by escort ships, having lost their course from the close bursts. Such abysmal marksmanship was characteristic of the enemy bombers. Their complete inability to hit even an almost defenseless merchant ship was confirmed time after time. If we talk about submarines, before the disbandment of the convoy, they did not sink a single ship and could not break through the guard at all. Even during the torpedo attack, when our ships were extremely busy, the submarines did not dare to attack. All the ships sunk by the boats were defenseless transports with no ASDIC, and sometimes it took three submarines to sink one transport. No wonder Allied sailors laughed when looking at pictures of German submariners receiving awards. The poor performance by German aircraft and submarines was a serious objection to the Admiralty's claims that it did not want to risk heavy ships east of Bear Island. In the opinion of many British and American officers, the Washington and the Duke of York would have had no great difficulty in dealing with the Tirpitz had it attempted to attack the convoy. It is quite clear from this book that no transport should have survived the disbanding of the PQ-17 convoy. It had the enemy stuck to the original plan, and had his submarines, aircraft, and surface ships acted more aggressively. PQ-17 would indeed have been completely destroyed, as Lord Howe predicted. Lord Pound had every reason to say that if he had had the forces at his disposal that the enemy had, and had he been in Denitz's shoes, he would have completely prevented the Arctic convoys from proceeding. The finale of this story is the return convoy, which was more decisively attacked by German submarines. In doing so, two American transports were sunk, as well as the lead British ship, a tanker, a minesweeper and a destroyer, by D6 dead ships, while the number of escort ships was twice the number of transports. Regarding the QP-14 convoy, Admiral I have always had one major complaint about this operation, both PQ-18 and QP-14. They used a special formation of guard ships, and that order remained unchanged from the beginning of the PQ-18 operation to the end of the QP-14 operation. But I believe this order was more suited to a fleet than a convoy, that a formation with a speed higher than eight knots. I am not claiming that this is absolutely true. But another thing is absolutely true. If a formation is under constant enemy observation, a more flexible cover system should be used. Perhaps the order should have been changed from time to time. It wasn't done. And if you analyse the submarine attacks, it will be clear that the Germans have worked out a way to penetrate the veil and used it constantly. We ourselves helped the enemy. What else can a submarine commander dream of? but that the escort ships will keep the same order for several days in a row. I remember looking with pity at the transports in the tail of the convoy. It seemed to me that they would inevitably fall victim to the next attacks made from these course angles, and it did happen. After many years, looking back, one cannot escape the impression that PQ-17 was doomed from the very beginning, and the worst premonitions were fully justified. However, it is easy to see that a few small miracles happened, the most remarkable of which was the remarkably small loss in men.
but in any case it was a failure. The remnants of the huge Allied convoy that was supposed to have saved Stalingrad delivered only a tiny amount of supplies. However, the Russians, despite this failure and waiting too long for the next convoy, did not break down. They not only managed to endure, but also drove the enemy back. The circumstances were in our favour, but it was the last smirk of fate after Pew 17. Things were completely different with the PQ-18 convoy. It was accompanied by an escort aircraft carrier. The escort included a cruiser and a large number of destroyers. This operation is described in sufficient detail many times. From that point on, all convoys had much needed air cover. So maybe the death of PQ-17 was not in vain? N. Rischel. What about the Lord Austin? After the QP-14 crossing, the trawler was assigned to the Western Approaches Command and based in Liverpool for a while. Then the old admiral who was the commander of the naval forces in Northern Ireland, almost with tears in his eyes, informed the crew that he had to send the ship to the Arctic again, though this time not to Iceland. Convoys were now leaving Lot U, because German agents had developed too much activity in Iceland. Austin went out with another convoy in the spring of 1943. This time, the weather was the nastiest it had ever been during the entire campaign in Russia. Water mountains simply overwhelmed the small trawler, and he, along with Lord Middleton, was forced to turn back. But the enemy showed almost no activity, and the convoy arrived in Murmansk without much trouble. Austin spent several months in Russia, acting together with minesweepers, and then returned to England. A few hours after the Allies landed in Normandy, the trawler accompanied the convoy to the coast of France. He was patrolling with the included Asdik around the place where the ships were parked when he suddenly blew up on an acoustic mine over which several ships had already passed. Austin broke apart and quickly sank, taking several crew members with her. Thus met his death a brave little trawler. One of the two British ships sunk during this operation.